I just want to open the whole discussion with, with a simple recognition that medtech projects are extremely complex and require lots of people and lots of disciplines. So I feel like I'm attempting to talk about a small scratch on what is a huge undertaking today, but the focus today really is around the connection and linkages of translational research through into commercialization and how design can help and champion better outcomes in that space. So, uh, okay, that's not clicking. Um, I'm, I hold two positions at the moment. I'm CEO of Tiller Design, but I'm also head of product development for MVision, which is a medical, a new medical startup uh, listed on the ASX and is developing a brain scanning technology for diagnosis and treatment of stroke. So a little tiny bit about the company first, and then we'll get into the topic at hand. We've been operating for um, nearly 30 years across all sorts of disciplines. In the last, say, eight years, we've had a, a big focus in the med tech space. We are also 13485 accredited for design and development um, under the med tech uh, standards and processes. Um, but we've had a lot of experience through all sorts of different projects from heavy industry all the way through to consumer, med tech, mining, military. And it's quite a unique and uh, interesting mix of skills and knowledge that we're now actually bundling and applying predominantly into med tech, as I mentioned. So the thing today is, um, well, what is, what is the role or how does design help translational research? And I think most of you might understand research, but just, and, and bear with me, there's going to be things that I'm explaining that are obvious and I'm hoping in the conversation we can spark some other talks or discussions about gaps and knowledge that you might want to learn about. So, but universities typically have a lot of research going, R&D labs, um, and then along comes a company that wants to commercialise that technology for a multitude of reasons, but principally they see an opportunity, a commercial opportunity, and typically a new company will then roll through its uh, uh, tried and tested accredited medical device product development cycle and that chart there is how products are designed and developed in the medtech space there's product design verification clinical validation regulatory clearance new product introduction which is npi and then it's launched and through the life of the device or product there's after sales service post-market surveillance post-market customer feedback and things like that but where i think um, the interest and this is where I made a, a, my personal interest lie, is, is this sort of gap that no one talks about between cold, hard research that really doesn't have a commercial focus into translational research. And there's often a gap there, a knowledge gap, if you like, between what the research team are now trying to translate into a commercial opportunity and designers can step into this space and really make a difference. Um, design leaders can connect with users and patients, which are right up the other end of the commercial opportunity, and bring that knowledge and language back to research teams and help them understand and even visualise where their research is going. And time spent planning, strategic planning and design planning in, in the translational research program saves a lot of money and a lot of time down the track. Um, so I just was... Uh, thinking about the common language that people use and you you may all be familiar with this idea of technology readiness level now this chart is pretty typical um, that typically you think of where you are in your program based on the technology ready level so i've got a question for the panel or for the group if you had a medical device and it was in clinical trial for the first time where do you think your product sits in this chart what level it's like three, four, five, six, seven, eight, um, and you've got two point six yeah. seconds to chuck an answer. Well, three, <laughs> since we're, I could actually organise a poll, but why don't we uh, get people to use the, the chat function? Um, sure. There's a chat. chat okay, I've got. Now. I'm I'm guessing. I'm guessing at the start of the uh, the blue. Yeah, around four. You think? seven eight yeah so the key the key here is um yeah okay it's interesting so most people roughly speaking come on screen 
can't transition my slide. Not sure why that's locked up. Oh, there we go. Um, in and around here is where people think. But what's interesting, this technology, ready, te technology readiness level chart is quite generic. And if you think about medtech, the key point of medical devices is, is, and it's mandated through standards as well, is human factors engineering. They're a prime focus of good design. And to get human factors engineering knowledge, you need clinical input. So you can be all the way up here and still fundamentally in research, in other words, back down here. So from a med tech perspective, um, and remember too, the correct environment is the patient and the clinical setting in a hospital. And so we're still in research, right back at usability. So there's this notion of changing the language to a more common idea. And this is, there are many of these out on the web too, but this is a nice one for, for med tech in particular. And if you think of the chart we just looked at, level six is more like level three, where we'd say proof of concept, concept of simulation and bench testing. And it's gone into the environment for some testing, albeit still needing to be highly regulated, in some cases certified to even reach that point. So it's, it's, it's a curious thing. And then, and then where this takes us in terms of the way we link and understand research is to start thinking about what are the risks and where's the knowledge gap to trans as, as the research transfers into a project. So if you think about, as you climb this sort of new med tech focused TRL chart and there's project risk heading out to the left and there's time going up the page, when you begin, there's a huge amount of risk and very little knowledge. And I'm talking about corporate knowledge. So this is the new company that's stepped into a research environment to try and begin a new, uh, to, to garner knowledge and create a new company. Very high risk, very low knowledge in the corporate setting. And as time passes and you pass through these layers, you're, you're diminishing, <coughs> well, you're trying to anyway, diminishing risk and leveraging up corporate knowledge. And by that, I mean building your independence as a business away from core dependencies on university researchers. So there's an interesting period through sort of level two and level three, uh, with, where the knowledge in the corporate area builds quite significantly, but the risk is still very high. And this is, this is where um, our team finds themselves today, actually, in a couple of projects. It's, it's very interesting to me. And this represents a period where the design team, although is, is heavily embedded with the research team, but the corporate entity or the company is only just beginning to build uh, competencies that can step in and start to replace what the researchers are doing. So there's a heavy dependence on the researchers, but there is a high level of knowledge about what we're doing. So the risk obviously lies in the fact that uh, the research environment, which is, can be quite volatile, you can lose key people quickly, they're, then they're usually running on 12 month contracts, two year contracts, um, there's a lot of risk in just being in that environment. So the idea uh, here is, and what we try and do, and, and this is where I think it's, it's critical, is you need to start to think about this period of time where knowledge is building, um, and knowledge is building and very high in the uni, but the, but the knowledge gap that you have is actually something you're not sure of. You need to try and quantify it. So if you think that we're in this, we've gone as far as putting a product into a clinical setting. The new company's knowledge is accelerating. The university has that knowledge and there's, a, there's by default a gap. Now understanding that knowledge gap is a really important and key driver for helping research translate successfully into the commercial setting. It actually goes, in my opinion, to the heart of some core business risks and mitigating those risks. So understanding these gaps, it, it is a business risk and it's critical to understand it and to address it. Now, if you address the knowledge gap, it helps mitigate the business risks by, by default, you're building strong teams um, as, the, as the new company's resources grow. Now the context in this is startup. So if you imagine an empty room, and in three years from now, that room is then filled with specialists that the company needs to help complement and or continue research. It, it 
once you know the knowledge gaps, you can start to identify and plan for strong technical teams as the company develops, and you can start to plan the transition to and from research. Researchers are gonna be with the new company throughout the journey. That's inevitable and it's healthy and it's a really good idea to hold on to those people and keep the connections and, and keep using them for the leading edge R&D. But after that, uh, you know, you're looking to them often to create core IP, but the level of critical dependency shifts over time to the new company. And if you don't plan that, you can get uh, overwhelmed with cash flow issues, project issues, communication issues. And it's, you know, I'm really speaking to one of the many kind of foundation stones, I guess, to a strong, healthy program. Um, but here, when I think of the design team, the right design team will actually lead the development programs and, and play another role where they're managing the researchers. They have the, and quite a unique ability, and a, particularly industrial designers, I think, have a unique ability to, to walk all the corridors. So they can go into hardcore research labs, they can go into, you know, they can speak to all the different disciplines and help bring, bring the project together. But the key baton, if you will, that we hold is what is the commercial entity's core desire? What is their core problem that they're solving in other words? And who is it for? Who's, who, who are the stakeholders? Who's the patients? Who are the key end users? And we will understand that group extremely early in, in what is ordinarily normally um, not really gone after until you get to a design and development program. So we, we inject that knowledge back into research teams and it helps focus them on why they're doing it. It's a powerful motivator. So we have one hand on the patient outcomes and one hand on the commercial opportunities and we navigate that up and down the link between research teams and the design and development team. Robert, can I just uh, flesh that out a little bit? Because yeah, sure. um, when you think about the kinds of risk involved, particularly if you look at the spectrum from, I guess, the scientific risk, which is mm -hmm. sort of oriented towards the fundamental research, right through to the commercial risk, you know, which has to do with, you know, cash flow and funding yeah. and, yeah. Um, you know, which, which are almost like, you know, completely different planets. It, it, mm. uh, and what I understand from what you're talking about and my understanding previously about human-centred design is that this concept of centering the process around how does this work for people uh, is sort of one way of trying to unify these disparate risk mm. categories of risk. But it's still, um, I would have thought even for something like human-centred design, the, 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 the range of completely and utterly different topics that the entrepreneur has to deal with and I feel very sorry for them at times because it's a real challenge. I mean, they're, it is. Yeah. They, they, um, I've often used this analogy. It's like it being at the bottom of a pit, looking at cliffs, learning cliffs or learning curves in every direction. And they're all very different. Uh, and they have to get their head around subject matters that, uh, and then, and they're the only people who, um, previously have been, uh, the entrepreneur, the owner is the only person who actually engages with every single one of those. So mm. is what you're saying that um, there is a role in this idea of translational research for somebody to essentially assist the, um, the CEO in understanding all those? Or yeah, are you absolutely. Limit, limiting in scope to just the human-centered Piece. No, so there's a lot in what you've just mentioned. So the first comment is human-centered design is is a, is a piece of the puzzle. Um, what what I guess I'm really trying to tune into here today is step back and look at the entire program. Look at the entire. Pro if you if you visualize successful outcomes through the scientific risks that you mentioned, they they need to move into a, a, a dedicated multidisciplinary team, and you need people around you, because you won't do it on your own, to help create that team. That team needs to grow strategically so you don't go broke along the way, so that you do answer the key questions. And I think that, um, so in short, no, it's not just about human-centered design. And I think the right design team, and the, the way we kind of structure our team is, is to collaborate with a lot of key skills to bring effectively a small group 
to bear on a program, on a project, and then help them navigate through all the different risks. There's, there's, and we haven't even got to product design and development yet. We're still creating the business for them almost. But there's a role to play in the research to mitigate if you have one eye on the end product, because you can, with being designers, and then the research is taking you down two different roads, they're gonna have commercial impacts. So if you've got someone in that camp that can look at those commercial impacts and steer it away from the bad ones, it's that kind of thing that I guess I'm trying to tune into and speak about today, the whole thing. Thank you. Uh, did that answer your question? <laughs> I think we're. I think, so. I, I think it's, it's a so huge, complex. huge topic. That's the problem. I think it's so complex <laughs> yes. um, that we're really going to touch on the surface of, mm. you know, getting to the bottom of the problem. And and yeah, I'm, I'd be interested to hear what other people you know think about this. So please do type in questions yourself. Uh, you'll hear me asking questions, but feel free to chime in yourself, and we'll ask Robert as we go. So I think coming back to that um, very high level and simplistic pictorial representation of research translating into an opportunity, some of the key benefits that, you know, I'm speaking now about the design team and the design team doesn't mean your industrial designer. In my mind, the design team is anyone contributing to the product development cycle. And the first step in this product development cycle is to define requirements and create design inputs. So that means research needs to get, in some cases, give you numbers, in some cases, give you material specifications. Um, the product design team steps back into the research and says, uh, I need information around this feature because that's what I need at the end of the program to have a commercial success. So it's a very intimate interlinking, if you will, of different disciplines and different types of questions. And overarching it is the design team asking the questions of various disciplines and people. Now remember too, when you're dealing with research, their prime motivator is to publish stuff. They won't be going out into the market and finding something that already exists that can do the job at a fifth of the price. So that, that's another really, key point about a good design team can look to the unique IP and obviously take it and hold it. But in some cases, you can actually still do standard engineering methods and design methods and answer it in a traditional way. It doesn't all have to come out of research. So there's, there's a lot of inputs to product design. And this chart really is only, we're only talking about translational research, but there's lots coming from customers, commercial, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe another talk one day, Tim. Um, but I see the key benefits of the right team. It, it really helps close the knowledge gaps in a controlled and strategic way. And that's the key difference. Rather than being surprised by news, we want to try and anticipate the outcomes and plan the different paths, depending on what those outcomes are. Uh, plan for failure, if you will, because research is very, very, by its nature, you just don't know where it's going to end. You're tracking down a path that's creating new IP and you've got no idea what the outcome is. And it, it's, it's going to go very differently to how you first perceived it. Robert, can I ask a, a question relating to this diagram, which has to do with this, what looks like a hard cutoff between we do the, tran you know, we do the research, yeah, yeah. And then we have a translational research period, and then we start the product development. And I'm interested, um, you just lost your slide, by the way. Yeah, it's coming um, back. Sorry, hit the um, wrong button. I'm just interested in understanding the... Um, Look, it's a good point. Oh, and, and the, yeah, you, you understand where I'm going with that. Yeah, there's no, there is no hard cutoff. That's, a, that's just slack diagram, forgive me. I mean, oh, the, this, this area that I'm drawing here, well, actually, if I clear that, if I just step into clear all drawing, in the product development, there are phases. Now, the first phase is about definition of requirements. So, you know, there, all of those, if you think of there's a line here, which is a point in the project where you've defined your requirements, up to that point, researchers and what they're discovering are feeding into it. So there's always, there's always overlap. I think that's where you were heading, but if not, ca carry on. 
That's right. Yeah. But the good um, question really was that, you know, um, at, at what point do you need to have a design freeze where you have to say to the researchers, look, sorry, but I know yeah. you've got a wonderful, great idea to contribute to this, but we've really got to stop. And, yeah. and so it's, that tension between waiting and also a tension between the imperative of, you know, mm -hmm. time to, you know, path to market and time to market mm -hmm. versus researchers who are very happy to, you know, um, continue researching. Well, I was going to say the first rule of research is never make it never end. Yeah. Um, so look, I think to that question, it's, it goes back to good program management and having people with experience who can champion the voices when they need to be championed and also control the pressure. So there's going to be commercial financial pressure, which is usually, it usually manifests as lead time and, and runway of money because startups are not revenue generating. There's going to be research pressure to answer specific technical issues. Uh, so we, we don't, we don't necessarily freeze the design until, uh, come back a step for, for medical device design in the product development cycle to push past stage one and into design and development, you can still have open questions, but once you start building and moving into verification that you're planning to use, in a clinical study for a future submission, for example, you want the design frozen, and if not fully, certainly in the parts that you're interested in. So we, we hold that door open for as long as possible, in fact, Tim. That's kind of what we I guess the, quest the question where I was coming from is, um, is there a risk of having to redo early, like the user requirements? You yes. know, if you know, they're evolving, then the whole product is in question. And so um, there, there's this question of how, how, how hard do you push early on to try and really set some boundaries around the configuration of the device, the usability of it, you know, the basic, um, you know, so that certain other product, you know, because there's always a, a electronics and software mm -hmm. Um, and product design that can cap happen in parallel with the research. Yeah, that's right. Um, but there's a, then there's a risk of having to redo that work if, you know, yeah. something changes and the whole user requirement yeah. changes. Yeah, look, at, I mean, again, they're touching on a lot of things there, but I think the risk is always there and the risk is always talked about, discussed and planned for and mitigated as best we can collaboratively. Um, the, the short, hard, answer is if you're building something for verification you've frozen the design at some point for some reason so it doesn't it doesn't mean in our world that you might do that and then push into a, a, a clinical setting to then verify user needs top level needs now you you'll get that data back and it will take you down a new path but it's it's never really a case where you just have to throw it all out and start again this this process is iterative and that's where it goes back to the very beginning of if you can, if you can take your commercial goals and then you can do some front end work in the product development cycle to identify the end users, the core problem and what they really want. And, and that parallels with understanding price points, understanding cost of goods, understanding the complexities of design. Then you bring that knowledge back into the research team. You can start to influence which bits they work on first where the really critical areas are. And this, what you're talking about is happening for us right now in two, two projects. So it's, it's a real, it is a real issue as in real, real world issue, but it, but it's managed through strong communications and as much strategic planning as possible and then building choice. So if a research path is high risk, we will drop into a second research path that's not high, you know, lower risk. So we're actually shooting for two outcomes to feed into the product development. Sure. Never put in look, all your eggs in one basket. I'm going to ask one more question because I do love this diagram, but um, one more question and then I'll shut up for a while to let you get on with the presentation. And at what Science point, good. at what point do you start implementing design controls? Uh, we actually, okay. We run design controls in an unofficial way, if you will, uh, while we're in this space. Now, the, what that looks like is 
requirements definition. Requirements emerge from research. And, and remember, when you're in the product development, you, you've got a whole lot of unanswered questions. They, they, they're not all sitting in research, by the way. There's other, there's other clouds that you're going to pull stuff from to feed down. So um, with our, the way we've set our QMS up and the way we approach a project is we, we enter it as if we're in formal design control. And then we just use it as a repository for data and a repository for requirements. But for us, it doesn't formalize until the first review, I guess. When we, so we let that percolate, if you will, in our system through phase one of the 13 for 85 process. Um, and there's sort of technical triggers. As soon as we want to publish anything for any form of review, it switches from being draft to a controlled document. So you can, even when we're back here in research, we'll run little mini research. Often, for example, we're helping them do experimentation by designing the test jigs. And in the case of Envision, we ended up designing and fabricating the antenna arrays in the headset scanner because the university couldn't do it. Everything that they did was only simulated. So we actually stepped in very early and helped them realize simulated environment to the real world environment. And then translating that to product environment. So, you know, I, our team will step in straight away and start the medical device design process, but we won't formalize a controlled document until it reaches its very first review, I think. It's probably the simplest way to explain it. Thank, thank you very much. I'll, I'll be quiet now. No, it's fine. It's all good. <laughs> um, so I think I think this is a, if we come back to the benefits, th this bottom one is, is really important that if we, if everyone in the project from the, from the janitor to the, to the owner don't have visibility of their commercial goals, the importance of positive patient and user experiences, you just won't have a successful project slash company slash whatever. Uh, what, once you take that approach and you really have that focus, it just, it saves a lot of time and money in the product design cycle as well so it's 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 the first thing that we champion and i think industrial design holistically tends to the good ones at least tend to take those approaches and champion that from start to finish so, and that's what we do we take these key bullet points if you like and and even way down here we're thinking about it and all the way up the other end we're thinking about it and as all the different disciplines lace in they will all challenge the integrity of the positive patient, patient outcome. It's engineering costs, regulatory time. They will all fight to diminish what we would visualize as the ideal product with the most likelihood of success. So it's a bit of a battle. Um, yeah, so just summarize, what have I got? Summarizing here, closing the knowledge gap between research design and commercialization. That's a very valuable thing to do. And that's what we try and do in this translational research space. Um, good design leaders connect the commercial goals to the research outcomes and time I've said that enough I think the more time you spend here the more efficient your larger costs downstream are going to be uh, I don't understand what it's I'm trying to change slides forgive me everybody it's happening There we go. Um, so I just thought I would speak briefly about the two current projects we're running, and then um, what's yeah, and then speak to, and then just let people ask questions. So at the moment, um, Tiller Design is involved with two major Australian medtech programs: the Envision Brain Scanner, which is a portable device for scanning and detecting stroke. The diagram on the far right is um, this one is the first what we would call proof of concept device really built and sent into the clinical trial setting to gather and um, garner clinical feedback now you'll notice that some of it looks like it's been designed and some of it looks like it's been lashed together what you're witnessing here is is um, like the headset for example which is a portable removable headset Going to clinical trial is an opportunity, a big opportunity to, to see how this idea is accepted and adopted 
in a clinical setting. Um, the trolley that it sits on, same thing, but there's, you know, there's trade-offs. So there's an opportunity here to really test design as much as the science. And the, the two sketches you see here is where it's heading. So it's actually the, the next model that we're building, which will be the first commercial device, is, is sort of lost that much height and um, all of the ergonomics is shifted based on more detailed uh, ergonomic assessments and studies. Um, and the, the key thing here is we're, we're very busy in design and development, advancing to uh, multiple prototypes which are pointed to a multi multiple site trial, but there are still a couple of threads in research coming out to solve, you know, technical, really high-end technical issues in and around. So this is an example, Tim, I think of your earlier comment where, yes, you can run in parallel, but there is a, there is a moment in time where you have to freeze it completely. Uh, and and we, we tend to do that only when we can answer the, cl the clinical need and the desire of the end user. So maybe just stepping back for a brief moment, all medical devices have a published intended use. That intended use filters and drives the way you get clinical, uh, uh, you get regulatory submissions for the FDA, TGA, CE, et cetera. The, they look to your intended use and then test for that to be real or not real and give you the ticket to sell the product. So the intended use is a very, very important statement and, it's, and it takes a long time to flush out based especially when you're in research coming into new technology because you don't fully understand the capability of your technology until you've been in the hospital and tried it out, et cetera, et cetera. So the way that tends to work out is the intended use and particularly um, in some of these projects I'm talking about, they gently move to use case scenarios and accepted usability and then you have your your package, if you will, you've got a design, it's intended use is X, and you've proven that it can do X through all this clinical study, then you're ready to go for a submission and sell something. So research trickles in and out of all of that. And it, and it also, as we design products, we discover ideas for even better efficiencies that might be good for generation two. So you'll feed that back into the research team and they'll They'll, inf they'll start looking at that for the next generation to keep it all rolling. Uh, a second project we're looking at is through the Queensland Brain Institute, and it's an ultrasound device for the treatment of Alzheimer's. Um, now, both of these programs uh, have very different strategies for implementation, but they are both leveraging translational research. And the research teams are big. Like, I, you know, I'm standing here speaking about research translating out into design, there is a huge amount of um, amazing work and clever people in both of these teams in the universities. And it goes to that notion of if you understand the gaps and you understand the skill set, and then you close the knowledge gap, you slowly translate core competency into the company, uh, which diminishes business risks and build stronger relationships with key people in the research teams and, and, and on you go. So the these two projects right now are front and centre for us, and they'll probably, you know, realistically probably run for another two to five years, I think. Um, anyway, general questions. Does anyone have any comments or questions? Hello, yes. So we do have some, some questions here, and I'd like people to um, type in more uh, as, as we go. Um, so Chris Bird asked, You've got you've talked about translational research in the mm -hmm. context of startups. Does it play a role in new product development for established yes. organizations? If you can, if you can, uh, well, the short answer is yes, um, and, and it's linked to the notion of what, what question are you really trying to answer. So, if you're seeking, if you have a specific technical problem that you just can't solve within the context of your own company organization or reaching out into third parties. And then that then links into, do I want to get new IP for this? Then yeah, you can enter um, research agreements with all the universities. It happens a lot, all the time. They're not cheap though. <laughs> that, is, that is one issue I think that the research community 
and the the commercialization design development community should start flushing out access to these skill sets doesn't really come cheap and it's not an easy environment to navigate and communicate in but yes short answer is it's it's a good idea because there's some seriously clever people with all sorts of crazy ideas doing amazing things in unis at the moment it, 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 it's sort of that question relates to, you mentioned, you know, this idea of version two and mm -hmm. uh, at what point do you um, cut off? You know, yeah, often that, that's, you commercial, know, that's a commercial decision often. But, but remember, there's limits. Like you, you don't cut off until you've got a device you know that is going to sell and be successful. So that's kind of the first limit. Once you reach that point, if it's addressing a segment of the market and you can get into that segment, quickly and happily and successfully, that all feels logical to say, well, there's version one, anything that's an improvement on that is brilliant, but let's treat it as version two. And it might be six months after you've launched the first one, but each, each context gets its own strategic planning and product development planning and program planning, if you like. The, um, the reason I asked is that uh, in, in the context of translational research and version one, version two, if at some stage you, know, you, you have a design freeze, but you have in the back of your mind that you're going to have a new and improved version uh, later down the track, um, mm -hmm. then really translational research never stops, does it? No, it doesn't ever stop. That's true. It, I mean, it does practically because um, agreements and funding stops. You know, like most of this stuff is at a high level commercially driven and now I think that's the core difference between research per se you know people doing PhDs and leveraging knowledge and then entering translational which by its nature is trying to lift lift out and become something in a commercial and or I mean it could be philanthropic that's true but it's still a, a desired endpoint rather than just exploratory one thing I've noticed with um a lot of projects uh, that we, we deal with at Genesis is that by the time that the, the, the you get through this sort of translational process and you get into full on product design, mm. two or three years might have passed since the initial patent was um, yeah. launched. And so you, you've, you know, you're burning up your time. And so it's not just a commercial mm. race to market, it's a, it's a race to market to, you know, maximize the, yeah. Your IP protection. Yeah. Well, the, look, IP strategy, and I'm, you've probably had them in the part. That that in itself is a huge topic. Um, so, I, you know, IP IP creation is one thing, but but freedom to operate is another. Uh, so, in in the context of the two programs we're in now that I was just talking about, there's a group, there is a team dedicated to intellectual property, documentation, lodgement, and freedom to operate. Um, research and as a design team we need to understand all that as well a to avoid area that you know you don't want to step on other people's intellectual property um, but it also opens up an intellectual property landscape so research feeds into that continuously and that's important and I think actually you know d good design teams should feed into that constantly as well uh, so your IP, your IP doesn't end up being a moment in time it's a continuous drop of new things and you build a portfolio. Well, the reason I, I, I mentioned this is that in, in two of the projects that we're involved in, um, whilst the, the core IP was sort of settled, you know, um, some time ago, uh, there is a desire on the, on the part of, you know, the, the people involved to essentially extend their, their, um, their IP coverage by you know adding new elements mm. to the ip portfolio and that can come about as part mm. of this design process yes exactly and, yep. yeah and, and and what's what's really interesting is your focus on knowledge that obviously knowledge underpins mm. ip and usually that's a fundamentally yep. sort of scientifically driven ip but you can come up with other ip protections relating mm. to you know the different arrangements yeah. Um, you know, industrial design arrangements, um, yeah. software. I mean, it, it, yeah, so. well, it's not just patents either. There's, if you, I mean, I, I like design registration, particularly if you think about a complex device that is heavily reliant on human factors, engineering, ergonomics, shape, 
I mean, shape and size and all that stuff to create its end use. Just simply protecting the shape of that object can be powerful. It means anyone who wants to copy you has to be slightly off what you've determined is the most ideal approach. So one of our tricks sometimes is to, we actually take a design registration on the desired object. We've done this in the military space actually, for grip, for hand grips. And then you take a design registration on the one 10% away from that and the one 10% away from that and you end up with say six or seven design registrations for a few hundred each. And you've kind of built this bubble around the space you wanna be in. So that, that just goes to IP strategy, I think. Generating new IP is important to businesses in this space because to your point, Tim, it takes a long time to come through. Sure. There's another question here from Chris Bird, which I think is great. It's a fundamental question. Um, you've talked a lot about the process and so forth. Um, Chris's question is, can you speak to some of the attributes and skills needed for effective translational research? Um, so, Chris, do you mean in the context of someone trying to leverage translational research or someone within translational research? Um, Chris might want to um, type that in, but I'll actually see if I can take Chris off. I think if I take the first filter, which I, within, okay. Um, that's funny, texting. Can you speak to some of the attributes and skills needed for effective translational research? Uh, it, it, to my mind, that actually, you know, talks about the, um, what is the definition? Have you got a definition of translational research? Uh, I don't have one at hand, no. But I think it sounds more like a philosophy than a, it, it, well, than, it, than it, a tangible it is a, thing. Yeah. No, it is a thing. It is a, it is a thing in universities. You've said industrial designers make good ones. Ah, okay. This goes to the concept of communication and the ability to see the big picture, if you will. Now that sounds simple, but it's not necessarily an easy thing to do. It's particularly when you're in a laboratory and the conversation you're having is extremely micro and it's, and it's dedicated to a scientific principle that you're barely keeping up with. But what you need, what you need are people, or you need this type of skills, which are, I think they're quite uh, generalist skills, which is just good, good listening skills and good ability to see across the program and understand fundamentally that we need an end use that does that, whatever that is. Now in the context of this conversation, am I getting there? So it's really just running generalist filters across the whole program. And that comes with, I think industrial designers make good ones because we've had lots of experience across all the different facets of product design from thought bubble to manufacturing. And in our case now, from meeting researchers all the way through to compliant products that have gone through FDA. So we're always looking for flags. So I think, I think fundamentally, Chris, it's, it's good communication skills. And then a willingness to collaborate and question and find like-minded people like that, that then just start building communities. So that, that's a bit wishy-washy, forgive me, but I think it really does come down to something as simple as good comms. I think I think what you're 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 saying there, Robert. You know the the word you mentioned that sort of resonated with me was you know, big picture, mm. because um, so many in this community will know that I'm a, I'm a doctor, Doctor Tim, but I'm not a medical <laughs> doctor. I'm a doc, doctor of philosophy in knowledge management. It's my my field, and and one of the one of the sort of truisms is that um, in in order to be a, a specialist, you, you invariably end up having a very narrow focus. Um, to get yeah. really, really deep skills, what they call uh, T-shaped skills. Yeah. Um, researchers typically have a very narrow top to the T and a very, very long deep. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the, the view, the broad view is sort of relatively limited, but the very deep. Uh, and, and that's, I, I see that the case in medtech, even something like, you know, intellectual property or finance or mm -hmm. other areas. Um, those people, you, you, to get deep skills in finance, you in, in very yeah. end up, you know, not necessarily seeing the picture of, from the researcher point of view. And so to get, you know, it is a case of, I guess, coordinating mm. uh, and, and trying to broaden the, the, the T to make it a, a more normal shape. Yeah as a team T rather than an individual T. So you bring all the individuals together. Yeah. So you need, I mean, you need to know, 
you need to know, it goes back to that concept of the knowledge gap. It's not just about knowledge and risk within research, it's, it's across the whole program. So engaging with the right people at the right time. I'm just, I've just figured out this chat thing. So yes, Chris, empathy, commercial acumen, I think are both really good examples. Empathy is a word that doesn't get used enough in my humble opinion. If we injected that into um, design and development and frankly into the commercial area a little more, I think the outcomes would be quite strong. Um, going down, trying to think in economical terms, does involving a design team equivalent to employing full-time work? Uh, it can, Luke. I mean, the, it, the nub of this question I think sits in, what are you trying to do? Where are your skill gaps? And remember, um, I haven't even mentioned it, but but funding all of this stuff is core and usually the first question and front and centre to everyone's mind, particularly in startup. Now, Envision is a very sophisticated startup. They're listed on the ASX. They, so they came with funding to get them to proof of concept. They've now listed. Um, but what, how do they put a quantum on what to raise? They do it through strategic planning with me as lead of the design team and with the design team in general to take that holistic view and say, we're gonna need this, we're gonna need this, we're gonna need this, that, and here's a burn rate. And so it's, it's, it's planned. So the question doesn't mean, often need to be asked, what can I do with the money I've got? The, a better question is, what does the project need to be successful? How far along that path can I get with the money I've got? Which triggers conversations around, how do I, what do I do to raise money? So. I, that make that question, Luke, makes me think about that answer. I hope it's relevant for you. So that um, question from Luke. Um, mm. Hi, yeah. And, and then the question from Matt Sheedy here. Um, what yeah. would you consider to be the essential core skills that an active medtech design team should have? Okay, and so uh, I think the core, I'll, I'll call it team members as opposed to skills, and the team members come with their specialist skills to make things happen. So you need a good design and development team that can be one person through to dozens of people. You need, uh, it's advisable to get regulatory compliance and that can be part-time, full-time. Now regulatory compliance splits, it goes to what do you have to do to comply with the product to legally sell this product? So that's a lot of that folds back to the design team if they're, if they're skillful. Uh, but it also uh, looks to what's your strategic What's your regulatory strategy to get to market? Excuse me. In other words, do I need an FDA submission? If I do, how am I going to get that? So there's under regulatory, there's kind of two forks. Um, you need a, I mean, um, eventually you'll need just core administration, sales, marketing, because linking to the end user and understanding the needs of the end user are very important for medtech. You actually, part of the standard is human factors engineering. You have to do certain blocks of work to show that you are satisfying the question you say you're satisfying. You can't do that without engaging with the community that you're going to sell the device to. So someone to represent that. Um, and money, finance, somebody to help manage finances. I mean, that's rattled off the top of my head. <laughs> get you started. Yeah, there's, uh, <laughs> that's, it's just touching the surface, isn't it? And it's, yeah. Um, but I, you know, I think um, it layers in as the company grows, the opportunity grows, subject to funding, you layer in the next, what you need, if you like. And, and then, I mean, the great thing about Australia and, you know, look to Genesis, look to Tiller Design and everyone else out there, frankly, it's a strong community of, of, skills that can come to bear for clients until they're ready to hand off and become their own thing. I mean, the other, I guess, elephant in the room is when do you put a quality management system in place? My personal feeling on that is don't do it until you have to. And in the early formative stages, if companies have 13485, it means they've got a QMS. So we have one, Genesis has one, and you can run your project in those spaces until you as a company are heading out to start making something or selling something. So, you know, that 
I often see out there in the community a real push to get your QMS first. Um, the problem with that is you're creating processes and work for the rest of your life under a certain model. So just step back, absorb a bit of the experience, look at other people. Anyway, I'm, I'm going to start talking for days if I'm not careful. Robert, um, we've exhausted the questions from the audience now, but I'll just finish with one, one final question. And I'm really intrigued by this, this idea of a knowledge gap mm -hmm. um, because it's, you know, in one sense, it's, it's bleedingly obvious. Yeah, well, yes, we've got to do that. But in the, other, in the other hand, it's when you think about, well, you know, what are we actually going to do about this? Um, you know, as engineers, you know, we always like to sort of systematize um, things. And, um, you know, how do you go about really, I guess, recognizing what that gap is, um, trying to address it, what particular techniques and approaches or is it all by osmosis no no it's Thoughts i mean in, in the context of this talk um it relate and which is you know putting a bucket a block around it it's relating to research so it's quite technical it's often controlled or, or the gaps become recognized through um through the requirements definition phase so in the medical device project for mvision we created an extremely detailed and high level set of specifications and and when you don't know the answer to something it just sits there as a big blank going don't know the answer so often that is the first port of call for us to study and understand where the gaps are and the gaps mean in that case we need an answer to this we need a quantified requirement and we can't solve it we then go so back to I, the research I guess that thing. question i guess that question you're talking about is like um knowledge you need to design the product yeah cycle. yeah but i'm actually thinking even further than that because you talked about the you know the end company mm -hmm. and and what i'm imagining here is um down the track when you you're off there selling your product and you've got an, an induction program for a new business development manager in that organization what mm -hmm. does that business development manager need to know about yeah um, you know not just the capabilities of the product, but the history of it, you know, where did it come from? What, what, yeah. Okay. The so there's, I mean, research there's, and they need to know. There's two filters there. So I've got, I've fortunately got both hats. So if I put on my Envision hat, because, um, as an Envision, um, did that just uh, something just, no, you're still going yeah. Okay. Uh, we've lost your slides, but I, I think that was, no, that's fine. Yeah. yeah. So, so, I'll come back a step. We, we use uh, risks, risk and hazard management, not just to manage design and development programs. We actually pull that out if I asked and do it for the, for the whole commercial program, the entire program. So often, and you don't do that in isolation. So there's other people from other disciplines in the business, founders, CEO, regulatory, the, the people I rattled off earlier. Ordinarily, I would want them all around the table so so heads and or representatives for all the different disciplines that are going to take you to the end point and then then you can just do a you could just do what i would ordinarily call a fairly standard hazards and risk analysis from a business context not a product context that will give you insight into what you need and if if that then points to a new business development person or a new sales person the company and and a different filter now if I pull back on tiller design hat, we ordinarily wouldn't go that deep because it's the responsibility of the company and it's kind of out of our remit once something's ready to go. But I would expect a new company to recognize strategically long before they need it, that they need a person to do X and therefore start to study and understand what that person might need. Now, do they need linkages all the way back to the research? I don't know, but, the design and development process under the standard records it all anyway. So the QMS is full of everything that ever happened in much like the submissions you'd put to the FDA. Um, yeah, people can hunt for as much or as little detail as they want and then sure. get on with the data, I guess. Last question. Um, right at the start, I thought of this question is when you mentioned this role of, you know, inserting this translational piece in between traditional research and product development uh, and, and the question of using somebody like an industrial designer to do that. 
Um, just how common is this, is this now? Is this something new or is it evolving? Uh, with, you know, I don't know. I don't know how common it is. It's something we specifically want to get involved in and have been getting involved in for quite a few years. Um, and it stems from a simple, a, a very simple thought, really. If your entire business is founded on intellectual property coming from that research group, the very least you should do is understand what the what, what the end user thinks of that uh, and a lot of uh, and it stems from observing i guess a lot of patents and a lot of clients and a lot of companies through the years cycling through our business that that really are asking us to do stuff that we we can already think of much much better ways of doing it it's a curious problem so it's a personal desire that started in me to get right at the source of the creation of all knowledge, if you like, and then help that connect in a real way to, to someone at the other end or something at the other end. Sure.